Um, also, by the way, I love that your your first intro into this was, I don't know that I'm qualified to be here. And like seven minutes in, you're already one of like the most qualified people to be a guest <laughs> on the show. Look, and I just say, this is just bananas. The proceeds of this monetized episode are going towards I Am Dying Out Loud. Find out more in the description. Well, Godless Granny, thank you so much for joining me for Growing Up Fundy. I'm so excited to talk to you. I've been looking forward to this for days and days. Uh, first of all, how are you doing? How's it going? I am doing fine. And thank you so much for inviting me. It is an honor to be here. And I almost feel like I don't belong here because I didn't act grow up Fundy. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So the the title came from talking to people who grew up fundamentalists, but I like talking to people who came from everywhere, people who grew up atheist and maybe you still are or aren't. Anybody who's got any background related to any religion, I just love hearing people's stories because um, I technically didn't grow up fundy either. Um, I think I made a joke once where I was like, yeah, we're all just grown up fundy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you're, you're welcome to to be here. I'm just glad you could you could sit in. I've been checking out your channel. And I remember I first heard your story on one of my mega streams that I did last month. And I was just shook. I was literally shook when you just gave me like a blip of your background. And so I've been looking forward to learning like even more about your story from your perspective. And so if you don't mind, let, let us in on it. Tell, tell us about yourself. Enough for me. Okay. Um, my parents were Catholic when I was born. And so I grew up Catholic from my very early childhood. But my parents left the Catholic Church when I was seven. So I don't remember a lot of my Catholic upbringing. Um, the biggest thing I do remember is that when my brother took got his first communion, we had a big party. The priest yeah. came over. There was cake. It was a big deal. And one day my dad took me to church and the rest of the family wasn't there. Most likely, probably my sister was sick. And so my mom probably stayed home with sick kids. Um, I don't know why my older brother wasn't there, but for some reason it was just me and my dad. And my dad said, would you like to have your first communion? And I said, yeah. I said, okay, come on. And so we went up to the front and he told me what to do. And when we sat back down, he said, there, you had your first communion. And I was so disappointed. There was no cake. There was no party. There were no presents. <laughs> why do you think they, why do you think they changed like that? Why do you think yours was like a, a hush hush kind of deal? I, I know exactly what it was. It was because they were getting ready to leave. It wasn't much long after that, that they left the church and they left the church over birth control. Um, they had four kids and that was all they wanted. Mm. And they knew that if they stayed with the church, um, you know, and, and didn't use birth control, they were going to end up with a lot more kids because it, it you know, in they, my, they, my parents had a child every other year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so when my brother yeah. came along, you know, they said, you know, th this doesn't look like it's going to quit. So one thing's got to go. And they decided to let the church go. Interesting. Cause mm -hmm. you know, usually when I talk to people and birth control comes up, it's that somebody's like staunchly anti-birth control, but it sounds like your parents were pretty progressive in that. Well, my aspect. parents were very progressive. That's amazing. Um, my, my dad went downtown. We lived in the Milwaukee area. We lived mm -hmm. on the southwest side of Milwaukee. My dad would go downtown to march in the anti-Vietnam demonstrations. Wow. He would go downtown to march for civil rights. Um, yeah, my parents were very progressive people. That's um, amazing. Although there was one area where they were not. And this, this one took us a while. And that was when it comes to transgender. Um, Renee Richards is the first person we ever heard of that was transgender. My parents did ridicule Renee Richards. The other thing is fat shaming. My mother was horrible about Ooh, fat shaming. Yes. Um, yes. But when it came to other people's rights, my parents were all for it. Interesting. And what do you think the the problem was that they had? I feel like the fat shaming is like a generational thing. I feel like grandmas that I know they like grew up in, in that time or like great grandmas, they all kind of had that mentality. But where do you think the 
transgender stuff came from? Do you think they just didn't know? I, I, and you were kind I of know afraid? that it came from not understanding what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, and because Renee Richards is the only transgender person they ever heard of, their feelings were that the only reason that Renee did this is because she wanted to play tennis with the women. Wow. And that absolutely was not true, but that was the right. way she was portrayed in the media. Right. Oh, oh, of course. When the media gets a hold of you, they get to decide what your your reason and your purpose is. That's wild. Mm-hmm. That's that's wild. And so what did they do once you left Catholicism? Did you join a different church? Did they do their own no. home church? Okay. We, we stopped going to church altogether. So I was pretty much raised agnostic. My dad had kind of a meandering journey through spiritualism. Um, he, he read a book on Zen Buddhism and for a while decided that he was a Buddhist and then decided he wasn't anymore. And, um, he, he, he never really bought into it, but he always kind of felt that there was something there. Mm -hmm. He didn't know what it was, but he felt like there was something there. My mother, on the other hand, she, she was kind of odd because her idea was there is no God. But if there is a God, it's the Catholic God, because the Catholic Church is the one true church. Yes. Yeah, that is hilarious, but yes. also <laughs> very like a, a strangely common thought process. Mm-hmm. Do you think it's because even though people are like pretty darn sure they don't believe in God, there's like that little voice in the back of their head that's like, but like just in case, like just in case mm-hmm. we're like i'll just i'll say out loud that that's the case so that if there are at the gates of heaven i can't say that i like denied christ or something like that yeah my mother would have been a great candidate for your show because yeah. she really did grow up fundy my grandfather was a devout catholic i mean catholicism was his life mm-hmm. and that was one of the things that really turned my mother off is the constant threats of hell. Yes. And I think that's why I never heard any of that because my that the really turned my mother off. My mother was afraid of fire and the constant threats of hell were were a big deal to her. Interesting. And so then how did you wind up a religious person? <laughs> like that's wild. This is just bananas. Like this is more interesting than I even thought and I knew it was going to be interesting. I'm fascinated. Uh-huh. Well, okay. As a teenager, excuse me. As a teenager, I started thinking about life as teenagers are wont to do and starting to think about what is my place in the world. And I couldn't answer the questions. Um, I could not come up with a reason for what the, a purpose to life or what, why, why life was worth living. And I was always kind of a loner. I I never had any close friends. And when I could not answer those questions, I decided that the best thing to do was to kill myself because there just wasn't any purpose to living. Um, But I didn't tell anybody that that's what I was planning to do. Um, I had it all planned out. I had taken a razor blade from my parents' bedroom and I had had it hidden in my bedroom for months waiting for a time when the house would be empty long enough that I could kill myself and make sure I was dead before anybody found me. Wow. Um, And while I was waiting for the right time, I had an English class where the teacher passed out books that were self-paced books and said, do do what's in the books. If anyone has any questions, I'll be in the back of the room. Oh, wonderful. Yes. <laughs> Probably <laughs> drinking, as you do. Well, the guy that sat in front of me, okay, first of all, this is the 1970s. Have you ever heard of yeah. the I Found It movement? No. Okay. I don't think so. I don't the think so. I Found It movement was a big revival that happened across the country in the 1970s. Yes. Yes. Okay. But And the guy remember. that sat in front of me became a Christian in one of these revivals in the, yes. in the I Found It movement. And so he wanted to share his newfound faith with someone. And because my name came right after his in the alphabet, that meant that I sat right behind him. And he had to be, what, 16, 17? I was 16, yes. Yeah. Wow. And so, you know, he started trying to tell me about his faith, and I didn't want anything to do with it. So he took all my books off of my desk and said, you're going to sit there and you're going to listen to me. 
And I did not want to go run, tell the teacher to tell him to give me my books back so I could do my work. So I just sat there and I listened to him. And one thing that he said to me was, um, you have an emptiness in yourself and, and you have no purpose in life and, and God can give you that and God can fill that emptiness inside of you. And I really felt like he had some kind of connection that God must have told him this because I certainly hadn't told him this. I hadn't told anybody. Yeah. Um, and so I, that was the hook for me. I thought, you know, this guy really knows something that I don't know. And so I wanted to find out and he didn't know much about faith himself. So he then introduced me to some of his friends who then shared some chick tracks with me. <laughs> Wow. He's like, you're going to listen to my friends actually tell you because I don't know enough about it, but like, you're going to listen to them. <laughs> well, he told me, you know, some things, although one thing he told me that was really funny was um, he was telling me about uh, creation and Adam and Eve. And he said, um, you know, when, when uh, Adam and Eve had um, a baby, but then um, the baby died and, or, or no, they had Cain and Abel, but Adam died. So Eve had to have sex with one of her kids to have any more kids. Otherwise, the human population would have been gone. I mean, I know. he's not wrong. <laughs> like, I mean, that, that is, if that was what happened, that's what would have happened. I mean, wow. It's, and he know, was just cool about it. He was just like, yeah. Yeah, he, he was just like, you know, I know that sounds really sick, but, you know, you know, that's that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> wild although that's really not the way the story goes but that's what you thought it was <laughs> that's wild yeah i've never heard the version where adam dies that's a new one mm -hmm. for me but that must be a revivalist thing so mm -hmm. just to, so to recap you were catholic until you were seven mm -hmm. then your first communion was abysmal at best abysmal <laughs> at best <laughs> so then you basically were raised agnostic and then you were like, you know what? Even though I'm a teenager, I'm just I'm just going to kill myself because there's no meaning to life. And then mm -hmm. this revivalist Christian who couldn't have been more than 17 turns yep. around and he's, he's like, hey, also. Yep. yeah, it's like, hey, you, you soulless Cretan, you're going to listen to my words as I remove your books from your desk and tell you about the love of Christ. Um, also, Adam and Eve, um, they had sex with their kids. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. But this is just wild. And so, so, so then I took the chick tracks home with me and I prayed the prayer and I became a Christian and I, I was a devout Christian for the next 42 years. That's why. And so for anybody who's unfamiliar with tracks, those are like the little booklets, the little pamphlets that tell you like prayers and, and verses. I've actually got one right here. I think um, I've always been afraid to open it in case it says like crazy shit. So Interesting. And so that's all it took? Or were there other things that really solidified your belief? Or were you afraid to not believe? Like, where did that, where did that charisma come from to, and what, um, what denomination did you, okay. did you go by at the time? Um, I did have a bit of trouble trying to pick a denomination at that point, um, yeah. trying to pick a church. My parents, you know, had no interest in going to church. I, so I had to find a friend that would take me because, I didn't have a driver's license yet. Um, and I did find a friend at school that said that her parents would take me to church. And actually it turned out, you know, they didn't have any room in the car for me and the, the logistics didn't work out that well. So they had a different family from church come to pick me up and sometimes they would come and sometimes they wouldn't. But I ended up in an evangelical free church because that's where my, where my friend was. I also tried out in assemblies of God church for a while um, but the speaking in tongues to me was just too phony. You know, I, I tried it and I said, yeah, I can do it too. And oh, everyone's so happy. We're all speaking in tongues. And, no, we're just speaking gibberish. Yeah. Yeah. Also, um, by the way, I love that your, your first intro into this was, I don't know that I'm qualified to be here. And like, seven minutes in you're already one of like the most qualified people to be a guest <laughs> on the show look at i just say this is just bananas wow so you were you you were basically like a non-denominational evangelical right i yeah evangelical free is a denomination in the north and um so when i went to college i did go to an evangelical free church yet um in my college town as well 
when I got to college, you know, I just absolutely dove into Christianity. Um, I felt like I was behind for having missed going to church for the first 16 years of my life. And I kind of wanted to make up for my lack of Bible knowledge. Well, first, first, even, even at 16, I read the Bible cover to cover to try to catch up to all the people who were, you know, had been reading this Bible, you know, every day for, for all their lives as, or so I had thought. I was going to say, um, who's going to tell her <laughs> most Christians haven't read the Bible. <laughs> who's going to tell her. <laughs> that was a rude awakening in a Sunday school class when the pastor's daughter didn't know how to use a concordance. And I was inwardly face palming going, I know how to use a concordance. How is it that you don't know how to use a concordance? <laughs> wow. And so you, and so like, did, do you think it, at the time, like in hindsight, did this all give you like genuine joy and happiness or do you think you were yes. just yes. given a when place? I, the first, the, the day that I prayed to accept Christ the, the next day when I got up, I, I felt tremendous happiness. I felt like the world had changed. And the funniest part was going to school and listening to my peers all going, uh, it's such a terrible day. We're all at school, you know. And I was feeling like, you know, the world had been reborn and everything was wonderful. Yeah. Um, well, and so like you had almost left this world. So I imagine mm -hmm. it was a lot better for you. It was. And that was one of the things that really called, caused me to cling to my faith is I really felt like if I lost my faith, I would die. And yeah. so for me, it was, it was a literal lifeline. Interesting. And did your family have one, any idea that that was ever a thing that you were planning on no. doing? And two, they how still did they don't react? Know. Oh, they still don't. Oh. And did no. they like, were they concerned at all with your newfound kind of like evangelical? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did they say? But not excessively so. My well, my dad was, as I told you, very progressive, and he was. You you can believe whatever you want to believe, um, although he would frequently tell me, you know, this. He he didn't put it quite this way, but he basically say, yeah, this is a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> uh, this is a phase. It's mm -hmm. not a phase, Dad. Um, that's well, one of the things is he, he would try to show off how, how much he knew about the Bible and how he knew so much more about my own faith than I did. Although I usually ended up showing him quite the opposite. Um, interesting because he grew up Catholic and he went to Catholic school and he talked about having gone to seminary, but seminary in the Catholic church is very different than seminary for a Protestant, which is it? for a Protestant seminary is graduate school yeah. for Catholic seminary is eighth grade. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, when, hmm. when they're in eighth grade, if they're in the Catholic school, they call that seminary. Interesting. I didn't know that. And so after that happening a few times, did he just kind of like let it go or, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. interesting. And so so you, you become an evangelical, you're in the church, and then um, did, you, did you finish school? Did you finish college? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so interesting. This says the, the number of like layers here are just fascinating. And so after college, did you like, did you s still feel that like a charismatic is the only way I can think to describe it. Uh, feel free to to correct me if that's not quite the proper term. But did did you still take that like charisma for Christ like into your life outside of college? Did it wane at all? Did oh, college like absolutely? In fact, one thing that got me in a bit of trouble in college is I did um pub I I did speak speech competitions. Really, me too. Yeah, I did forensics. And me too. That's really, I did great. debate also. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's you're the and, only other person who's ever said forensics in that that uh, meaning to me in that in that category. That's awesome. I I I won the school trophy for outstanding speaker of the year three really? of the four years I was in um, college. Yeah, Godless Granny, you are a woman for my heart. You are quickly <laughs> becoming my favorite person. That's wild. That's uh, a small world. That's wild. But one thing that I did that now is kind of cringeworthy, and I, I, I'm, I'm amazed that people were as patient with me as they were in those days, is I made so many speeches about my faith. You know, if, if I got an impromptu topic that I could turn into proselytizing, I did. And I made sure everybody knew how to accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior. And, and I know the coaches were sick of me. 
<laughs> I, that's so funny you say that because like I've always said that I am so grateful for how patient everybody was with me when I was in debate and forensics as well because I was so like um, I, I was a nice person, but I definitely thought that my faith made me better than a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's only through patience and, and just them deciding to like have conversations with me and continually, you know, ask me questions and stuff that I really ever opened my eyes to anything outside of what I'd been told at church. And so it's so funny that you say that. Um, but Hey, you still won the, the award though. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think they gave it to you so you'd stop talking about church? <laughs> no, they gave it to me because there weren't that many of us. Um, Pi Kappa Delta was the speech fraternity. And yes. Yeah. I, yeah. My roommate and I were president and vice president of Pi Cap all four years. And we just would switch back and forth between president and vice president because there were only like six of us in the club all together. And we were the only two that were always there. <laughs> yeah, I'm a member of Pi Cap too. This is wonderful. Godless Granny. This is just wonderful. <laughs> but I bet also you deserved it too. Like I was joking. I'm sure that you were a fantastic speaker. And so did that have any impact on like doing research and stuff like that? Did that have any impact whatsoever on your Christianity or did you stay pretty evangelical? I stayed pretty evangelical. It really didn't have any impact at all. And so then when you went off kind of into the real world after college, did you find it difficult at all to remain evangelical or did you? Not at all. Okay. I met my husband my sophomore semester of college. Mm -hmm. I, I did college in three and a half years. So it was only a sophomore for one semester. Um, <laughs> That's so cool. Um, and he was... He's three years older than I am. So when he graduated, he got a direct commission into the army wow. and then had to wait a couple years for me to graduate. And then we ended up graduating, uh, getting married the day after I graduated. And wow. the reason we did it that way is because while I was a freshman in college in Wisconsin, my parents moved to Louisiana. And when wow. graduation came up, they said, we will come up for your graduation or for your wedding or if you do them both at the same time, we'll do both. And, you know, if, if I, I, I kind of wanted to have the wedding a couple months after graduation, but I also didn't have any place to live because I lived in the dormitory my entire time in college. Wow. Mm -hmm. So wow. I, we said, you know, we'll just get married the day after the, you know, the day after graduation. And that's what we did. I got gradu graduated on Saturday, got married on Sunday and, after the wedding, we drove off to our honeymoon and then to my husband's apartment in Texas. Wow. So was it a pretty sizable wedding? Was it like pretty small? Um, There were a hundred people there. Um, That's pretty sizable, I would mm -hmm, say. Mm -hmm. Wow. So the minute you graduate from college, you get married and then you go to Texas. Mm -hmm. Where? And I married to an officer, a, a second lieutenant in the army. Wow. And so that. we moved a lot. And so I went to a lot of different churches. And that's why I say I've been in a lot of different denominations. Yeah. Interesting. And was he also religious as well? He was, but not anywhere near to the consent, to the extent that I am. Um, one thing that's kind of funny is that early in our in our marriage, you know, I was like, okay, we need to, we need to get in the choir. We need to teach children's Sunday school. We need to um, you know, get on a committee and he's, why can't we just be pew sitters? <laughs> Listen, I just want to be a bench warmer. That's it. That's all I want to do. God will know I'm there. He, he'll he take attendance. It's fine. Did that yeah. like offend you in any way or were you relieved? It didn't offend me, you know, because, you know, he can do whatever he wants to do. And especially since he's my head, you know, he's the spiritual leader of the home, you know, he gets to lead in any way he wants to, but he also stayed out of my way to to do whatever I wanted to do, and I was always very involved in church. And he, I, I dragged him along. You know, anytime the church doors were open, I was there, and he he always came with me. You know, it wasn't like he said, "I'm not coming this time." He he always came with me, and he did start getting on some of the on some of the committees and getting into some of the leadership, but. He he was never you know he never did the mission trips that I that I did the short term mission trips and he never um, you know I would always teach VBS and he he didn't do that because that was in the daytime while he was working you know things like that um, 
But one thing that's kind of funny is now that I'm not a believer anymore and I'm not going to church anymore, he finally gets his wish. Now he yes. gets to be a pew sitter. <laughs> yeah. And, and like, if you want to, if you don't want to skip ahead this far, I just was wondering like what it's like to be married to somebody for so long. And then like, it sounds like a lot of the root of who you were as a person was religious. So yes. how do you navigate deconstructing with somebody who knew you as like an evangelical? Is that tough to do? Or or was he just glad he didn't have to go to church anymore? <laughs> he, he was just glad he didn't have to go to church anymore. The, the big thing though, is I can be very persuasive. I believe it as a member of PICAP and an award-winning speaker. I believe it. I will not challenge you, ma'am. So when it comes to talking about faith, that is now off the table. He he doesn't want to talk about it. Interesting. Interesting. And like even in the even in the respect of like you not believing anymore, like just having conversations about that it's, or it's more in that he doesn't want me to talk to him about why I don't believe. Got it. Got it. And, and I, and I don't think he knows this, but I really think it's because he's afraid I'm going to persuade him that, that there isn't any truth to it. And he doesn't want to go there. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel that I understand mm -hmm. that. Like, I know that for some people we can like dive into the research and the interest and be like, Oh shit. Like I don't believe any of this anymore. And other people are like, no, 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 no. Wait, <laughs> like keep it to yourself. I'm going to do my thing on my time, you know? And I totally understand that. That makes sense. It's, it's, it's very much like any other journey, like fitness or weight loss or like going through school or quitting any kind of habit like it has to be that person's pace and that person's idea otherwise mm -hmm. the entire thing's just going to implode so that means um so when you were like super evangelical did that i mean I, i'm assuming that definitely impacted how you raised your kids like they were probably oh, definitely I, I i sent all my kids to christian schools wow my apologies um <laughs> <laughs> wild yeah um we tithed you know there was oh it, at least 10 percent um frequently more um usually more uh of our money went to the church you know and on top of that we also sent our kids to private christian schools um my oldest daughter is still very evangelical interesting um, mm-hmm D but it was my son that pulled me out. <laughs> yeah. D does like, does she know about like your channel and stuff or? She does. Um, I've made four videos for children um, specifically so that I could tell my grandchildren about why I'm an atheist. Um, the fourth one that I made, I made specifically for my oldest grandson, because when I was there, he asked, if you don't believe in God, where do you think the universe came from? And That's unfortunately, I did not have the opportunity to answer him. We were getting ready to leave somewhere and it was time to go. And I didn't get a chance to answer him. So I made a video specifically answering that question at an a eight-year-old level. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. And then I sent the link to my daughter and said, you know, I made this just for your son. Um, if you would be willing to let him see it, I, I, you know, it'd be nice to let him know what I think and why. And She's no. Yeah. Yeah. I, no. I was going to say, I was going to be shocked if he, if he got to see that video that day. No, um, he did not get to see that. And so what was it that like, how did your son pull you out? Like, was this av as a teenager, as an adult, like what happened there? He was a teenager. He was in high school at the time. Um, it was either, let's see, it was his senior year of high school and it started. Well, Okay. There, there were a number of things that were causing fractures to my faith along the way. Totally. And the biggest one had occurred shortly before this conversation with my son, um, which was uh, I started reflecting on the life of Paul and arrived at the divine hiddenness problem. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that's what I had done until 
I related the story to Answers in Reason about a year and a half later, and 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 I saw him analyzing the clip that I sent to him, and he said, "She's describing the divine hiddenness problem. She just doesn't have the vocabulary." And I went, "Ah, okay." <laughs> it's like touche. Yeah. Wow. So that was interesting. But basically, what I came to was, all right, Jesus personally appeared to Paul. Why? Because. God wanted Paul as, as a servant. Does God know what every person needs to know in order to believe? Well, obviously, yes, if he's omniscient. Okay, so if God doesn't tell each person what they need to believe, then either God doesn't want them to believe or God can't tell them what they need yeah. to know. So either God isn't all loving because a loving God would want everyone to believe or God isn't all powerful. He's not able to do it. You know, yes. it, it, it has to be one or the other. Yes. Um, now I did, I, I switched from Armenianism to Calvinism um, oh, about halfway through my Christian journey. Wow. And the Calvinist perspective is that God does not want everyone, that, that God That's only God. wants the chosen, the elect. And the elect were chosen even before the beginning of time. And one thing I did during that reflection that I had never done before, and I try to do this to Calvinists, and I'm surprised that it's not as effective as it was with me, you know, finding it on my own, was for the first time I thought about what Calvinism means to the unelect. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a death it was, sentence. Right. We're always taught to think about oh, isn't it wonderful that we were chosen and we get to go to heaven? And for the first time, I thought about, all right, but only the few are chosen and the many were predestined to hell before the beginning of time. That, yeah. that is inconsistent with an yeah. all of God. Yeah, and how so, do you know that like everybody in your congregation is one of the chosen? Like For all you know, there could be half of them could be predestined to go to hell. Mm -hmm. That's bananas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So at that point, I kind of came up with my own theology. And my theology was a form of universalism. And in my theology, I figured that the Bible wasn't the whole story. I still believed in in inerrancy. I, you know, that inerrancy of the Bible was the foundation of my faith. And I'll get to in a minute why, why I, I was, you know, dead sure that that was the rock bottom base um, now I've lost my train of thought. Sorry. Um, you had Calvinism. We were talking about how you oh, like developed yeah. your own. The theology I went to was that the Bible wasn't the whole story that, um, you know, some people come to believe during this life and, and God is pleased with that. But if you don't believe during this life, after you die, God will give you all the information that you need to believe if you want to believe. And then you can make an informed choice. And you can choose whether you want to spend eternity with him or etern eternity with apart from him. And that was the theology I came up with at that point. And, you know, honestly, like, that's one of the more reasonable, like, versions of the. I mean, if we're talking about, like, theology in general, which there's some whack ideas out there. Like, this idea that, hey, maybe we make the decision afterward and the afterlife. Maybe that's not, like, that's. Of all the things I've heard, that's not too terribly far fetched for me to to think about. And so, did that bring you peace, or like, yeah. did you? Yeah, like, it did. I, I I could live with that, but I still believed in biblical inerrancy at that point. Yes. Yeah, and I'll tell you why the Bible was the foundation of my faith. Partly was because of the Calvinism solo scriptura, but the big part was the worst year of my life, nineteen eighty four. Um, in 1984, um, my husband and I moved from Fort Hood, Texas to um, Fort Knox for a six-month course that he was supposed to go through. I was seven months pregnant at the time. So we moved to a place where I didn't know anybody, and I didn't have a church, yeah. and the baby died. Oh, no. Um, and so I had no friends. I had no family. I had no support. And we just lost our first child. Oh, no. Oh, that was your first? Yeah, that was my first. Oh, no. That, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Wow. Um, so 
I really struggled with my faith at that time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Understandably. I, I felt like I was praying to God and I was praying at a brick wall. It, it was like, you know, the prayers were just bouncing off the ceiling. And Mark and I took a trip back to La Crosse, Wisconsin, where we had both gone to college. And I went and visited the pastor in the church that we went to in college. And he was no help at all. Um, you know, he said, well, if there's a brick wall between you and God, then, then you need to fix that. That must have been something you did. Yeah, exactly. Right? That's exactly. like, I feel like that's a lot of, a lot of the lessons you learn in like American Christian churches are, well, what did you do to bring this upon yourself then? Cause it's mm -hmm. on God, it's you. Mm -hmm. That's so sad. He had this opportunity to really help you in your time of need. And instead he was like, IDK sounds like you fucked up. Yep. Yep. Wow. But I found a book that really helped me, and it was called Where is God When Life Hurts? Mm, and right. that book really, you know, it, it's a very Christian book, and I wouldn't believe a word of it anymore. But at the time, it was extremely helpful to me. Yeah. Um, and with that, I, 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 could, I got to a point where I could say, I don't understand this, but I can just accept that, that somehow God has something good in mind through all of this. And at that point, I also examined my faith as to why do I know that God really is there and why do I know that God really is true? And it all came down to the Bible. And that's that's how I established the Bible was the bedrock of my faith. And as long as the Bible was true, I would believe in God. Absolutely. And, and that's something that I think a lot of people don't think that atheists understand is that religion can and like faith and the Bible can be a a place for people to find solace and hope and um, to kind of um, express their grief. Like I've definitely seen religion and Christianity be a good thing for people that they needed in that moment. You know, we're not sitting mm -hmm. here being like, that's ridiculous. That's dumb. How can you do that? Blah, blah, blah. It's like, that makes perfect sense. Like it sounds like in that time in your life, you just needed something to tell you why, like, why is this happening to me? You know, especially when you've been devout, you know, you've done everything right. Um, so that, yeah, that makes perfect sense. And so I'm honestly like, I'm shocked you were able to maintain your faith. I don't know that I would have been able to maintain my faith through something like that. So kudos to you. Cause man, that must've taken work. And so uh, like, after that, what did you do? Did you kind of resign yourself to building a life there? Or did you guys move after the six months? Like what happened to that period? Well, before we left Fort Hood, we had we had bought a house in Colleen, Texas. And when we went to Fort Knox, we had not sold the house. We rented the house out. And the, the lease was up right about the time we were ready to leave. Um, so my husband asked for a compassionate reassignment because of the loss of our child to go back to Fort Hood. And it was granted. Oh, so we good. got to go back to the house that we owned. We got go to go back to our old church and our old friends. So just two months after, let's see. Yeah. Well, three or four months after it happened, we were able to go back to Hood where we knew some people and we had, we had a support group again. That's good. That's really yeah. good. And so- then is that also where you raised your kids or did, did you move um, again? That? Well, Mark was in hood for four more, for four years after that. And then I had, I had two children while we were stationed at hood. Uh, then we went to Arlington, Texas, where Mark had a one year course. And then we went to Fort Wayne. Wow. Uh, so two of my kids were born in Texas, but Robin was born in Indiana. Interesting. And so, it sounds like you guys moved around quite a bit at the time. Did you, was like your first instinct to always find like a church to kind of build yes. a, 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 yeah. And why also why Calvinism? Why did you, what was attractive about okay. Calvinism? At um, the time? When we went to Fort Wayne, um, I was working at a Christian company. I mean, that's, oh, that's how deep I was. I mean, yeah, my whole life was, was Christianity. I went to work yeah. for Brotherhood Mutual an insurance company that insures churches and church organizations. Wow. Yeah. And so I asked some people at work, where's a good place to go to church? And several people rec rec recommended Brookside Church, which was an evangelical Mennonite church. And we went and checked it out. And the first thing we had to ask was, well, 
my husband's active duty army. Is it okay to be in the army and be in this church? And they said, it's okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're, we're not pacifists like the, yeah. the regular Mennonites. We're evangelical Mennonites and we're a little more progressive than the other Mennonites. So yeah, it's okay to be in the army and be in this church. So we joined that church and we became very close with another family. And at one point that family left the church and went to a different church and the different church they went to was a Calvinist church. And so my friend was saying, Hey, you know, we've, we've checked out this. We think Calvinism is a more biblical understanding of, of scripture. And so we went and visited their church and, and there were some major issues that had come up at, at our church. And so I, I was ready to leave our church anyway. And so when she's, when I started learning the differences between Calvinism and Arminianism and why they believed that it was a more biblical position, I was very persuaded, not only by, by the arguments, but I was very attracted to the pseudo intellectualism of Calvinism. Um, you know, the pastor was very into these are the books you need to read. You need to, you know, these are the things you need to study to, to really understand and, and have a deep knowledge of God. Yeah. And that, that was, you know, that caught me. Um, yeah. I will was, say, I will say, I have never met an unread Calvinist. Like mm -hmm. I've met a lot of like, like Mormons and Methodists and Baptists and whatever's that have never like picked up a book on their faith, including the Bible and like really checked it out. I've never met a Calvinist who hasn't read like 13 books on what it is that they're talking about. Whether or not I agree with those books is different, but like at least they do their research, you know, mm -hmm. like not mm -hmm. something I ever thought I'd say, but at least Calvinists, they stand behind their beliefs as a tro like no matter how atrocious the, 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 the spectrum gets and they, they read a lot about it. They know, they know a lot about it. And so how does someone who is this indoctrinated, like, professionally, spiritually, emotionally, familially, uh, congregationally, how does somebody like that get convinced to not only leave, but this, like this is going to blow your mind. My son came to me and said, you know, mom, the flood didn't happen. And I said, oh, really? How do you know that? And he said, well, for one thing, the poop would have killed them all. The methane gas from the poop from all of the animals would have killed everybody on the ark. And there was I've one thing I already that. knew about that. And that was that um, there was a pig farm not that far from where we lived. And you can smell that pig farm a mile away. <laughs> because the pigs produce so much methane gas. And yes. I read up on something somewhere that said that if you put pigs in a barn and close the barn door, they will all die. You have to keep it. You have to have not only an, a couple of open windows, but you have to have fans going to keep moving that methane gas out because they produce so much gas. They will kill themselves if you enclose them. Wow. And so I, I had known that. And so when my son said that, I thought, you know, that, that, that could possibly be right. Yeah. So, of course, you know, he's a kid. I'm the adult. I'm supposed to know more. So I said, no, you're wrong. But as soon as he left the room, then I get out my computer and I look it up. Yep. <laughs> Except probably more like this. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and uh, I found about three different websites confirming what he said that, yes, it is impossible to fit 10,000 animals on a boat and one window and them not die of this asphyxiation. No, no, um, the methane is what kept the ark afloat. You're, you, the, you're right. It was there, but it kept them afloat. Go read about it. Go read about it. Okay, so that that drew me enough to be intrigued. Then my son showed me the um, a, a video of Aaron Ra at the ark protest. Oh from, boy, I don't remember which year. <laughs> <laughs> and Aaron Ra was talking and he said, we know the flood didn't happen. We know it from history. We know it from biology. We know it from geology. We know it from mythology. And as soon as he said history, I went, God damn it, he's right. Because for the first time in my life, I put together two different things that I had always known, but had just never put together. 
And one was that I know something about ancient history and I, I know how long the Chinese have lived in China. I know how long the Mayans have lived in South America. I know how long the Egyptians have lived in Egypt. And there is no time in history where there's this 100 year gap where everybody all gets wiped out by a flood. And then 100 years later, people start trickling in again and they restart the civilizations. And I just had never put it together that what I know of history disproves the flood. And wow. if the flood didn't happen, then the Bible isn't inerrant. Yeah. And if the Bible isn't inerrant, there is no foundation for my faith. And wow. in that one moment, the entire thing collapsed. Was it like devastating for you or a relief? It was more bewildering. Numb? It was it was more like you've got to be kidding. You know, I've been believing this all my life and it was absolutely wrong. The one thing that scared me was I enjoyed going outside and looking at nature and saying, wow, look at all the things that God created. Isn't God wonderful? And I thought, you know, I'm never going to be able to do that again. But the first time I went outside and went for a walk as an atheist, and I went, holy mackerel, all of this occurred naturally. This all evolved. And that was, that was quite the experience. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. When you, the first time you look around and you're like, this is all science. Uh -huh. well, like science has just been happening around me and I've just been denying it. I've just been giving somebody else credit for all this science. Yep. That's yep. wild. That's wild. And so like, did, I mean, I know that there's like a, that period of like shock, but I, I don't know about you, but when I first started to deconstruct, there was like a period of mourning. It was like, no, it, I actually you didn't I, have that. No, I didn't. Um, <laughs> did you ever like go to your son and be like, Hey, so you're right about the methane. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> or was he just like waiting for you to come around and like, I ah, think hello, he was just waiting hello, for me mother. to come around. Because then, then, then he showed me um, Polygia and Vice Rhino and Logic and Professor Stick. And I suddenly realized that there was an entire world of knowledge out there that I'd been missing um, because wow. I'd been wearing blinders and only looking at things that agreed with my faith. And I suddenly realized that there was so much more out there. Yeah. And how, how recently was this? Um, it was four years ago. Oh, because like now that you're saying all these names, I'm like, wait a second. That's really recent. That's, oh, so this is like, so, so you deconstructed like in a millisecond. In 2019. Like, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you just like took off. You're like, well, mm -hmm. this is my life now. Wow. And like. Do you do you spend like every day just like thinking about how different your life is now than it, it would have been if that hadn't happened or like oh yeah what's oh, yeah. that like yeah yeah interesting and so I mean I've got so many questions so when you're uh, so you have three kids mm -hmm. two are two of them religious and one of them is not or no actually not? we run the gamut because the oldest is is very religious. The middle one is kind of spiritual. I, th I think she, she might be a deist. We don't really talk about religion much, but I imagine, you know, yeah. she obviously doesn't go to church. Um, she doesn't buy into any particular religion, but I, th I do think that she believes in some form of a God. Yeah. And yeah, then of course my son is an atheist. Yeah. So that's your youngest son. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And so, um, then you did you just start your channel like right away just thinking like I have to get more of this out there or what was the inspiration there well my inspiration was Shannon Q um I watched an episode where Shannon Q was talking about how there aren't enough female atheists on YouTube there aren't enough female atheists out there telling their story and talking about this and so I said you mm -hmm. know I'd, I'd like to do this and I found out the godless engineer lives right here in Huntsville really uh-huh so That's I took cool. Godless Engineer and Casey out to dinner at a nice steakhouse here in town. And I asked him, how do you do it? And he told me. 
you know, he said, you know, you, you can go on to a YouTube video that will tell you what equipment you need. And, and, um, you know, he, he said, you know, my whole thing is stand up and use your voice. And, you know, absolutely. You go for it. Stand up and use your voice. I said, you know, I've only been an atheist for a few months now. He said, doesn't matter. You go out doesn't there matter. and you stand up and use your voice. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, I, I was in a premiere with Godless Engineer just the, uh, a few days ago. I mean, in the in the side chat, and and somebody says, "You've been supporting him for twenty eight months. You've been out here for a long time." And I said, "Godless Engineer got me started. I will always support Godless Engineer." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and also there's always going to be brand new atheists mm -hmm. and they're always going to be looking for somebody they relate to. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you're out here making content and, you know, maybe at that point you'd only been an atheist for four months, there's somebody out there who's been an atheist for two months who you've got seniority over and they're interested in hearing more from people who are, you know, they haven't been doing it as long as Aaron, but they've been doing it like longer than that individual. Mm -hmm. I think that's like, a, I think that. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Th that space is always in need of voices because we've got the the militant atheists and the famous atheists and the uh, published atheists, and there's not a lot of brand new atheists out here uh, highlighting the fact that they're brand new. I think so many people try to hide the fact that they're brand new, um, mm -hmm. and and so that's that's great. And so, were you nervous the first time you posted a video about it? Did, were you mm -hmm. nervous at all? Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. were your thoughts? Like, did you think there's going to be backlash or something? No, I wasn't. I, I was more afraid of, of, of anonymity of, of yes. nobody hearing me and nobody seeing me. But, um, one thing that happened before I started is, um, there was that thing between Shannon Q and Ken Ham where mm -hmm. Ken Ham called her a sexual humanist. And I was doing a lot of crocheting then. And my son had just gone off to college. I was a, a new empty nester. I really didn't have anything to do. So I crocheted her a blanket and crocheted the the letters to spell out sexual humanist and sewed that on. And I sent that to her and she was so impressed. Um, so, you know, that's how I got to know her. And of course oh, she weird. told Paula Gia. So right. when I launched my channel, she announced it and Paula Gia announced it. And I had 250 views on my first video within 24 hours. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's And, you know, that's that's one of the, my favorite things about this space that we're in is the support. Like, mm -hmm. just the number of times huge creators will tag and share and comment. And you're just like, wow, you, ha you have no time for anything else. And you still had time to come here and, like, support my content or somebody's content. That's that's so encouraging. And so it and sounds then, like you just took off. Right. I did. And there was something that Vice Rhino said that really helped as well. And that was, um, he said, the first video that I ever made, it was crap. But I've learned so much since then. And yes. I feel the same way. Go back and watch my early videos. They're crap. They're they're really bad. Like just in your in like in your opinion, production quality or like research uh, content. Mostly in, no, no, mostly production quality. Um, yeah. I I tried to wear makeup sometimes, and I've always been really bad at makeup. The makeup is terrible, um, so I look awful. Um, I was still trying to figure out how to use the editing software, and there's a lot of editing mistakes in them. Um, so you know, I've learned so much along the way. Yes. And if yes. I hadn't heard Vice Rhino say that he, he started out with a crappy level of production, but look where he is. I said, you know, if he can do it, maybe I can too. Yes. Yes. The number of videos I have hidden from the public on my YouTube channel because they were all the fledgling stages of my YouTube life. You know, the terrible production, terrible sound quality, weird green like video tinge because of the laptop camera. Yeah, no, totally. And I think that's also really cool too, is that you have this, this physical timeline of your your transformation and your change um to look back on that's wonderful I, and so do you do you ever like oh, i'm trying to think like do you ever wonder who you might have been if you hadn't had that conversation about the like the methane if it hadn't just started with that or do you think this was always kind of in your trajectory and it just needed somebody to point it out I think it was always in my trajectory and I just needed someone to point it out because there were, I, 
I had moved from being extreme conservative to being very liberal over the decade before my deconversion. And I already felt like an outsider at church because I was so much more liberal than all of my, you know, the people around me. Yes. Um, and my husband is too. My husband is very liberal. Um, so I, I, I think it would have come eventually just because of that. So when you were super evangelical, you didn't really have like evangelical like, political opinions or anything, or did you, but just like I less so than everybody on. else? Yeah. I did early on. Um, the The big thing that changed me was Christopher Yuan's book, Out of a Far Country. Um, I in in the in the Calvinist church that I went to, um, I started a library from scratch for that church. It was a fairly new church. Wow! And as church librarian, I went to the librarians' conference in Wheaton, Illinois, every year. And I had a blast there, you know, buying like lots of books and yeah. meeting other librarians. And we had a book exchange. Any books that you didn't want in your library, you brought and you put on the free table and you could take books from the free table. From That's awesome. The, the Left Behind series, there were always hundreds of them on the free table. Because <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like they were uh, left behind on the free table. <laughs> Oh, good one. I'm ashamed of that. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'll edit that out. <laughs> well, anyway, one book that I found at the conference, a new one that I picked up and I bought, and it looked kind of interesting, was Out of a Far Country, which um, Christopher Yuang is a professor at Moody Bible Institute, and he's gay. And wow. he talks about how to be gay and be Christian. Yeah. And he talks about how he counsels people at Moody who are gay and how they can live a Christian life. Now, one thing that I know, you know, pretty much any gay person would be very vehemently against is that he says that if you want to be gay and be a Christian, you, you need to be celibate. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, thanks. <laughs> no, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> but that book took me from thinking that, being gay is a sin to realizing that no being gay is just the way some people are it 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 helped me to understand what it meant to be gay and and how a person is just is gay that just that's just the that's way just, they are yeah right and i didn't know that until i read that book so that that was step 1 for me into liberalism yeah and then step 2 was the book called Mama's Boy, Preacher's Son, and I can't remember the name of the author, but he's um, he's the guy that started the group GLAD. Oh. Okay. So he had a different perspective, which is he is gay and Christian. And I didn't know his that. Pers yeah. Um, his perspective is that um, it's okay to be gay and in a gay relationship and be Christian. And, and he spells out why he believes that that is biblical. And so, you know, that shifted me a little further. And then the next thing that really started shifting me is my son got into Jordan Klepper and a show that Jordan Klepper was doing at the time. It was a spinoff from The Daily Show was The Opposition. And it was so funny. I learned so much from comedians. I think yes. comedians are really good at shaping public thought. And Jordan Klepper, I credit with taking me the rest of the way from fundamentalism to being liberal. That's wonderful. Did you know I'm a stand-up comedian? Have we ever talked yes, about that? Yes, I did. That? Okay, I wasn't yes, sure if we I talked did. about that. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm entirely biased, but I agree with you. Interesting. <laughs> that, that's I, well, e even as a young person, you know, when I was in my teens, um, gosh, I can't remember his name. There was a columnist who wrote political satire, and it was funny, and it was... And I cannot remember his name, but it, it it was funny and it really helped you to think and, and focus your political opinions. And that was where I really understood the power of comedy and, yes, you know, how it can really help shape your thought. And so, yeah, comedians have, have had great impact on, on what I think about the world. Wow. And so what is the, with the exception of your belief in God, which I know is huge. Um, what is an opinion that has changed the most because of your deconstruction 
that's non-religious, like maybe a political opinion or a social opinion or a thought that you have that's that you think is related to your deconstruction? Definitely the acceptance of the transgender community. Had I not deconstructed, I would not have been able to accept that a person can be transgender. Interesting. And was there just like a, a particular thing that you read or was it just opening your mind in general that made you more accepting of the transgender community? I think it was just opening my mind in, in general. Um, yeah. Now, Robin's best friend in high school is tra was transgender. And Robin is transgender also, although at the time I didn't know that. And mm -hmm. I'm not even sure if Robin had realized it at the time either. Excuse me. Um, but uh, I started learning to accept Robin's friend, even though I disagreed with what he was doing. I also didn't agree that his parents should reject him for what he was doing. With it. Right. I looked at the journey of a young transgender person as more of the journey of finding yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if that's where you want to go to find yourself, you know, you, you, you go, you do you. But I, I, I thought my thought was always that at, at some point you'll come back. Yeah. 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 And then uh, they don't. Because that's just who they are. Yeah, right. that's and it was it was meeting Jenny Morgan and um, Polymathic Jen that they are the ones that really educated me on what it means to be transgender and what the medical studies are because I didn't know any of that until I met them and of course I met yeah. them after after I deconstructed. Yeah. And it's also, it's amazing to me to look back on all the opinions that I thought I had at the time, back when I thought I was a, a religious Republican conservative girl, which I laugh my ass off about now. But it's interesting to, to look back on so many of the opinions that I had that were either everyone else's opinion, so I just went with it, or unnecessarily not my business. Like, mm -hmm. like it, it took me way too long. And I like to think that I was a, a highly educated individual, but it took me way too long to realize it's not costing me money. It's not an action that I have to do. It's not a club I have to join. It's not physically or emotionally harming anybody else. So why am I worried about it? Why <laughs> is it my business? Um, yeah. And it's interesting how many people, even though it literally doesn't impact them in any way, they still have to find a reason to be offended and threatened by it. And, uh, mm -hmm. and to me, that just seems exhausting. That just seems like an exhausting life to live. Yeah. Some other events that occurred that, that started pushing me liberal were the election. I can't remember what year it was. It was sometime in the 90s when Sarah Palin was um, the candidate for vice president. Yeah. Yes. I, I could see how stupid she was. Yes. And how unqualified she was. And it really turned me off to the Republican platform. And yet all of my friends and people at church were, oh, look at Sarah Palin. Isn't she smart? Isn't she? No, she's an idiot. No. You know? yeah. Not only is she an idiot, but she's literally the caricature of a dumb conservative like woman and i'm not saying women are, who are conservative are dumb i'm just saying like they almost right. put her out there like a an snl character like i remember thinking her version of her was funnier and more ridiculous than tina fey's version of her you can't you can't like out sarah palin sarah palin yeah, yeah. and yeah. it's just and you're like and why would they yeah because of that i ended up you know voting democrat way back then and my oldest two, you know, even at that age, became much more liberal because I was liberal, and and my oldest did feel rather, um, I don't want to say isolated. That's not quite the right word, but you know, a lot of her friends made fun of her because she was a Democrat, and yeah. she had a best friend who was also. How can you be a Democrat and, and a Christian? You know, Christians have to be Republican because of abortion. That's and, wild. That's yeah. wild. Yeah, my my best friend is a Christian and a Republican, and she still is like, 
why are we talking about this at church? This does not belong in church. She she literally found a new church because the one that she was at was like preaching that exact message. They started talking about how like if you're a true Christian, you're a Republican. And she's like, right. absolutely not. These two things are separate. Separation of church and state. You know, she used to work in politics and she's – luckily she got out. Thank God. Uh, <laughs> thank God, ironically. Um, but like even – people who agree with the Christianity and the Republican should look at that and say, whoa, 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 like, hold on. I'm a fan of both of these things. And I still don't think they belong here together, like intermingling. Um, mm -hmm. I was talking to Andrew Seidel about uh, a white Christian nationalism and how even Christians should be upset about white Christian nationalism. Like even devout Christians should look at that and say, this isn't good for anybody. This is not a good thing that's happening. Um, and that's what I did in 2016. And that's why that's one of the reasons that I left one of the churches that I left. Um, and that kind of, that was one of the things that kind of set me up for my deconstruction is I left the Baptist church that I'd been going to because there were so many people that were just so gung-ho Trump Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to hear it at church um, that we went to a different church that was much smaller and we never really got into that church. I never dove into that church the way I normally dive into that church, into a church. We weren't there long enough for me to get, you know, involved the way I normally get involved into a church. So when the Bible fell for me, my church was someplace I'd been going to, but didn't really have any close friends yet. Yeah. And did you ever like come out as an atheist in your household or did it just kind of like oh, yeah. happen or uh, was there a moment well, where you had to be like, look? Well, when it happened, my son was right there, you know, and, and when, when I heard Aaron Ross say, you know, we know from history that, that, that the flood didn't happen as the Bible isn't true. And my son was, yeah. <laughs> Your son's like, oh, welcome to the program. Welcome. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't remember exactly when I told my husband, but I know it was not too long after that. And for him, it was just like, oh, okay. You know, I don't believe this stuff anymore. Oh, okay. Do you think he believed you, or do you think he was like, yeah, okay, like well, I'll see you tomorrow oh, when I you want to go to church? I, I know he believed me because, um, you know, Sunday when it was time for church. I said, I don't believe anymore. Oh, okay. And he's like, so I can, I can go watch TV. He's like, so I can, just, <laughs> I can go. Like, well, he goes and watches church. Wow. Well, actually, at the time, it was, it was still pre-pandemic, so he, he just went to church by himself. Oh, wow. And he actually started going to a different church that, because he, he didn't really like the church we were going to all that much, and so he started going to a different church, and uh, he was good with that. But then the pandemic hit. And he started watching church online and he's been doing that ever since. And so now when it's time for church, he goes in the bedroom with his computer and watches his church service on his computer. And then when it's over, he comes back. Okay. Church is done. Interesting. And do you think he and your son ever talked about like the fact that your son like revealed the atheist in you? Do you think they ever talked about it or do you think they just don't talk about it? No, they don't talk about it. They don't, they don't have a real good relationship. Yeah. Well, and I imagine like with differences in like gender identity and like faith and religion, there's just so many layers there that it's probably easy to just not like not even go there. Uh, that's man, what a what a wild ride. So now you're an established atheist. You have like five thousand followers on YouTube. You have I wrote down three hundred and forty three videos what's next for you? Where do you see yourself going? Are there any goals you have? Like, do you want to become a speaker or an author or like what, what's next for you? I have started writing a book. Um, and I'm thinking that someday I might publish it, but I'm, I, I haven't worked on it for some time. There, there's one topic that's, that's quite sensitive and two of my kids know nothing about it. And I'm not sure if I want to put that out in public. Yeah. And so I'm not sure if I could ever publish my full story because there's there's some things in the story that they don't know about. But then I, I keep kicking around, would it be better for them to know about it? And I, I don't know the answer to that question. 
what about like a pseudonym, like a, a an author name? That's yeah, I could do that. I, I could do that. Mm-hmm. Interesting, v- very interesting. And so there's like this potential for your memoir. And then, do you think you'll just keep diving like headfirst into YouTube, or do you see like I other? I think I will. Additional- One- I don't know how long I can do this. Mm-hmm. Um, I have had a severe scoliosis, and Ooh. so I I don't move very well. Um, and I want to do some traveling. I want to see London, and I want to see China. Um, I, I'm thinking in terms of bucket list. Um, yeah, longevity does not run in my family. Um, mm-hmm. Very, you know, my mother lived to be 76, wow. um, and she was the oldest. Wow. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think end of life. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I just, I just want to put out videos for as long as I can. And when I can't anymore, just see my grandkids. And, yeah. And then I've had a good life. Yeah. Well, and the wonderful thing about platforms like YouTube and TikTok is that you can always come back to those when your mobility has declined. Like it'll be there for you. You can't always travel. You can't always see the world, but you pretty much can, thanks to technology, always make your message known, put videos out there, put content out there. So it's not even like you would have to stop doing that if you didn't want to. It just may take different, you know, navigation tactics. I can't remember her last name at the moment. Lydia. um, Gosh, I can't think of her last name. Her husband is also an apologist, but she makes videos laying down because she has severe back problems. Mm -hmm. McGrew. That's it. Lydia McGrew. She's she's a Christian apologist and wow. she she does videos laying down on her couch. That's amazing. That's a, mm-hmm. and there will I feel like technology will just get better and better. There will be stands you can use. You can get a little tripod even now. You can get a little remote so even if you can't reach, yeah. There I feel like there will always be space for your opinions and your thoughts and your content, but it's the it's the experiences you won't always be able to get back if you, you know, mm-hmm. if you don't do them. Well, that's wonderful. Godless Greeny, I have just had the most wonderful time talking to you. Like, I knew that your story was going to be a good one, but I have just, one, been mind boggled. Two, I have so much respect. And I and I talked to you a little bit about this on the live stream that day. I have so much respect for somebody who can say, yes, I spent decades in this lifestyle. I said those things. I did those things. I believed those things. I acted in this way. And I have changed my mind. People don't understand how much courage and strength that takes, especially when it comes to Christianity. They like they just don't understand the ramifications people can sometimes face when they reject God or when they no longer believe Christianity. It's just the the amount of loss you can face from so many different facets of your life is just immense. So the fact that not only did you come out and say, I don't believe this, I, I literally can't believe this, like I can't unlearn what I've just learned, but I'm now going to use the time that I have to promote what I've learned and this message and this important lesson to anybody else who might not be where I'm at in terms of like my deconstruction journey. I just think that is the most wonderful thing. And I'm so grateful that that you've decided to do that with your platform and with your voice because it's such an important thing. It's it's really important. So thank you for doing that and for sharing with everybody. You are mm-hmm. most welcome. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel I feel very lucky that I stumbled upon atheism at a relatively young time because I was I think I was maybe 25 or 26 when I really confronted it and I still felt like I had wasted so much time. I still look back and go, "Oh my gosh, I can't believe it." And so <laughs> and so the the fact that like you had grown kids, like you were and you're still just championing forward and not not even worried about you know, like, oh, okay, yeah, we spent that time doing what we did. But one, that time probably made you better at what you're doing now because of your experiences. Those life experiences make you who you are today and make your message that much more valuable. But also you just, you seem unbothered and I love it. You just seem totally unbothered and you're like, I can fix it from here on out (laughs) at least, Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. I think so many people get caught up in the sunk cost fallacy of it all. 
that they mm. like I know so many people who stayed religious for so long because they had I don't know I've put in 30 years at this point might as well and you're like nope I'm gonna take off and live the rest of my life the way I want I think it's That's wonderful right. if, if if you've been going the wrong direction it doesn't help to keep going in the wrong direction <laughs> right right like if if you are yeah if you're driving the wrong way <laughs> Do you just keep driving the wrong way because you've been doing it for 100 miles? Or do you say, I don't know, maybe I should turn back? Yep. That's So if you had a message for anybody listening to this or watching this, um, and maybe they aren't sure, maybe they think they're Christian, but they're not sure. Maybe they know for a fact they aren't, but they don't know where to go from here. They're one of those brand new atheists we were talking about. What would you say to them? What would your message be? My message would be learn. Um, you know, learn what, what you can about what it was, why did you believe what you did believe? Is Was there any real reason to believe it? Um, was there any foundation that that is based in truth for, for what you believed? Did your beliefs conflict with reality, with science, with history? Um, but my tagline for my, for my show is live your life. And the reason that is my tagline is because as a Christian, I was so focused on, okay, it's Jesus, others, yourself. I serve my God. I serve my husband. I serve my children. I did not have time for me. And so now I live my life. That's amazing.